I was a former store manager at Target. I had 12 of them that I oversaw. And every single day I'd find shelf, uh, promotional shelf tags lying on the floor. And mm -hmm. so my customers would not know that those products were on sale. And so by having electronic shelf labels in your stores, and also if you use other technology, i.e. computer vision, you can make sure that your promos are promoted to the customers at the right time when they're in your store. Because I can tell you, having been a merchant at Target headquarters, that the sales on that product will go up at at least six times. I, I was at a conference recently. The sessions on, on generative AI are like, how to use generative AI? What is generative AI? You know, what is generative AI versus AI? And I was thinking back, like that is probably exactly what the conference titles were like in e-commerce back in the late nineties. Like what is e-commerce? You know, how do you do an online transaction? We're at the same place from the learning curve standpoint. So I think from my perspective, it's one I would take seriously because I think it's a transformative technology. There's a lot of opportunity to make the marketing we do more relevant and to scale the marketing to more people. And that's where generative AI is particularly interesting to me is be able to scale things to more people more quickly and to reach a wider audience than you ever were before. And therefore, if you do that in the right way, you should be serving up more relevant product to people at the right price. So what's your thoughts on the, the real business value of, of Gen AI? Three areas that, you know, generative AI particularly was going to have an immediate impact on the retail industry. And the first of which is one. All right, in episode 14, we'll be talking about AI and the future of retail with Chris Walton. He's a CEO of, um, he's a co-CEO of OmniTalk Retail, one of the top blogs and podcasts that covers the latest advancements in the global retail industry. He's a senior contributor to Forbes and a former VP at Target, where he focused on the store of the future. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. So the main reason I, I invited you to the show, you know, it's AI portfolio, um, is because that many of us as data professionals were building direct business data products for AI, using AI, or trying to solve different problems. And oftentimes, retail is a top vertical that people are going after and where they go to try to find customers. And you're a top expert. So you spend a lot of time speaking to retail executives. What's their mind thinking about Gen AI today? Oh man, that's a really good question to start with. Um, I would say there's, it's a mixed bag, honestly. It is a really mixed bag. I talk to some people that are, that are super excited about it, very pro what it can do for them. And then other people where they're like, this is the most overhyped thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, I, when I step back and I take like a 30,000 foot view at it, Mark, um, or look at it, it feels a lot to me like e-commerce in the mid to late 90s. You know, you had some people that were just rushing towards it. Other people that were like, eh, this will never work. I don't want to buy something online. You know, I'm not comfortable with that. So what am I going to do? And, and you know, what? And, and I feel like that's the same attitude right now. It's the people that, you know, are naturally curious about things that are interested in it. The people that are maybe not so curious are the ones that are very skeptical of it. But the, the risk to me is you have to be looking at it and be curious about it because if it is what it is purported to be, the risk of not understanding it and adapting to it is too great. Similar to what happened with e-commerce, right? Those companies that sat on the sidelines of e-commerce and you know, started letting Amazon run their websites, for example, until 10 or 15 years later, they realized, oh my God, we need to do this ourselves because Amazon's about to eat our lunch. Um, that's a potentially real big issue here with AI and in general AI broadly and particularly generative AI in terms of its applications to retail too. So, so that's, that's, that's what I, that's how I, how I look at it. I also think it's funny just as a quick anecdote. I, I was at a conference recently and you know, the, 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 the sessions on, on generative AI are like, how do you use generative AI? What is generative AI? You know, what is generative AI versus AI? And I was thinking back, like, that is probably exactly what the conference titles were like in e-commerce back in the late 90s. Like, what is e-commerce? You know, how do you do an online transaction? You, we're at the same place from the learning curve standpoint. So, so it's going to be really interesting to see. So net, net, long story long, I think it's all over the board. Executives are, have very different, very, very, very different and varying opinions on the topic. But I think from my perspective, it's one I would take seriously because I think it's a transformative technology. Where would you say e-commerce really started? And from that 
from that point where you're talking about what is e-commerce? What what year would you say that was? Oh man, that's a really that oh my god, that's a really fascinating question. I mean, I mean, you could make an argument that e-commerce started back with Sears Roebuck, you know, with the with the catalog business. I mean, and that's the funny thing about retail. Like retail's retail we like to say on our show what is what was once old is new again. And e-commerce just made the catalog business more relevant and easier to use than anyone ever uh, was able to use it before, right? But it's the same idea. You know, you'd get sent a catalog, you could see what you wanted, you could order it, you could mail in for it, you could call somebody on the phone, you could get it delivered to you. E-commerce just took all that hassle out. And by the way, they also made the universe of products available to you so much more expansive. And then you could just click everything. And when credit cards came into play, it became super, super easy. So, but I think, you know, if I look at your the core of your question, I mean, I think it's really around the advent of Amazon and eBay for the most part. Those are the two that I think led the charge in terms of making e-commerce, at least in the United States, what it is today. So we're talking, let's say early 90s. Yeah, like mid, 94, mid 95. Yeah. yeah. When would you say... Because you'll see where I'm going with this question. Mm -hmm. When would you say e-commerce was, people were like, oh shit, we need to get on this. It, there's no, like, it's definitive that this is the future. What year yeah. would you say that was? Well, I have firsthand experience with that. At least at one major US retailer, top 10 US retailer, that being Target. I would argue Target didn't take digital or e-commerce seriously until roughly 2013, 2014. And I could argue still that they're probably not taking digital commerce as seriously as they could be. I think if I look at other companies too, Walmart, I think Walmart started taking digital seriously around the jet acquisition, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, was around 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Um, and so I think, you know, between the years where overall the retail industry started taking it seriously was 2013 to 2016, depended on the retailer for the most part. But then what really changed it for the most part was also the pandemic. The pandemic forced everyone to be like, okay, we need to get digital religion. We need to get it fast because we have no other way of talking to our consumer right now. So we got to get on board. Now the question is, do they hold on to those tenants that made them successful during the pandemic or do they slide back and get comfortable and that's why the generative AI or the AI question in total is so interesting to think about because, you know, do they slide back? Do they get comfortable? Do they rest on their laurels? Or do they continue to be curious and push the envelope towards what's new and potentially game changing? So it sounds, based on what you said, probably safe to assume a 10, probably a 10 year time span on, or eight to 10 years or eight to 12 years where people are like, okay, this is the direction. Any executive that bets the farm on it won't get fired, et cetera, because I imagine that's what it's like at the executive level. Yep. Uh, they take somebody who's willing to risk their career to, yeah. to make a game changer. Um, yeah, that's a really good point because, you know, we always talk about too in retail, retail innovation cycles every, you know, 20 to 30 years. And so if you look at what we just said, like e-commerce started in 94, 95, people started really thinking about it in 2015, if we take the midpoint of, of those years I gave you. And then now here we are 10 years later, and we just see the advent of generative AI around, what was it, 2023 when that came out, when we first saw the, the first inklings of it, or maybe like mm -hmm. late 2022. Um, so then we're at that 30-year crest point where, okay, now there's something new. And that actually, just even talking to you makes me think this is the next thing because of the timelines that we've seen historically in retail. And that 30-year timeline goes all the way back. You can trace it all the way back through history, all the way into the 1800s for the most part. Ooh, interesting. It, it would be cool to just see a, a technological review of retail because the sense that I have now is that the entire time we've been building the infrastructure on, with, on which to accelerate. Mm -hmm. So it took 10 years for e-commerce to get to where it was because uh, there was not proficient data infrastructure in place. That just wasn't mature. It wasn't easy for you to be elastic. And now you're coming into the age of accelerated compute. So I actually, at least my hypothesis is that that 10 year thing where it says Gen AI is the future, I don't think it'll be 10 years because it's accelerating way too fast. And, and the infra, the, the groundwork is there for folks to build bigger. 
and not, you know, the foundation is pretty full. That's what I'm getting a sense of. Yeah, you're kind of taking the Moore's law approach, like things that are things are going to speed up, you know, over time technologically. The trick with retail, though, is you're still having to move physical goods from one place to another and put them in front of your consumer and get them to the get them to your consumer at the end of the day. So I think that puts a little bit of a of a cap on a how fast it can move. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So the software side will move, but there's so much physical architectures and physical substrates involved in retail at the end of the day that I think there is a little, I think your cap, cap's a good word. There's a cap to how fast it could probably go. So there's a true physics to this industry that does not exist in other industries. A hundred percent. And I think that is what, honestly, I think that's what some of the VCs in Silicon Valley, I mean, Mark Andreessen's famous for saying, you know, at some point we'll all be shopping online and no, you won't, you know, there's still physical dynamics that are at play here that are very important to consider. Mm -hmm. I was talking to, I interviewed a guy, you might know him, uh, Ramsri Gotham Gola. He's he's quite popular on LinkedIn for micro SaaS applications. So he lives in India. Okay. Uh, What he was telling me is that fast commerce is eating e-commerce's business in India. So within 10 minutes, I can get anything that I want. And folks like Amazon or whoever the big e-commerce players are there won't necessarily taking that into account in mm-hmm. high dense markets like that? Are, mm-hmm. are you seeing that maybe happen in the US or other domains that you're aware of? It, it's interesting. I've heard about that in the US. We've seen some talk of that in Europe, although that seems like that trend has slowed down in parts of Europe as well. I think the US, that conversation is a little more difficult. I think it's something that's just, it's pretty nascent for the most part. Um, and the, the real reason for that is the US infrastructure, again, the physical infrastructure, has been set up already to make our lives that convenient. So for the most part, a lot of us live very close to a grocery store because of the suburban sprawl of the U.S. following World War II. So the option of us just getting in our car and going to a store and either going to the store and buying it ourselves or having it ready for us curbside is very attractive from a cost perspective relative to the increased fees you have to pay to make the ultra-fast delivery, the instant delivery work. So there's, there's a, that's the rub in the U.S. market that I think for the most part, people haven't cracked the code on yet, which doesn't exist as much, say, in, in, in countries like India, particularly where some of the dynamics are very unique. Mm-hmm. How, you, how do you think that labor dynamics will play out? Because mm-hmm. you know, I think the common thread here is that the retail business uh, is a high physics <laughs> business. Mm-hmm. It, it moves lots of things to move. And I, I think in regions like India, your cost of labor is, is marginal, or almost nothing. So you can move things that are, you can experiment with things a little differently. What's your thoughts on, you know, the India market versus the U.S. market, given that labor filter? Yeah, I mean, the labor, the labor question is still a good one. I mean, the cost of labor is definitely going up. But in, from the retailers I talk to, too, there's still a big reticence to put big capital deployments towards fixed uh, investments in things like robotics to replace labor, because there's only mm-hmm. still so many things that robotics can do inside a physical store operation and inside a, a warehousing operation and to move goods from place to place. They're still fairly limited. And so it's difficult for the retail executives to want to make those bets right now for fear that something's going to change or the technology will get obsoleted. So for the most part, I would say retailers are still leaning in to physical labor because it gives them the flexibility to understand what it is that they need to do for their business model or to use things like third party, you know, gig providers to help them understand that too, or to do the things that they just can't afford to do themselves. So, so that's the dynamic I think here. I think, you know, for that reason, I think you're going to continue to see human labor be a big factor in the U S but going back to the original conversation we're having, I think the AI component does make your utilization or your productivity of your labor better over time. And and that's where I think the real music will start to get played here as people think about this going forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So what's your thoughts on the the real business value of of Gen AI? You know, we have have a stamp today. I'm sure we could revisit this question (laughs) once every six months and as time goes on. Uh, But what's your initial gut? feeling given what you've seen over the years? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question too. So I, it's funny, I actually go to the experts on this one. So I actually had um, the head of e, AWS's digital commerce on my podcast recently. Um, and I'll give you a tease actually, because the episode hasn't been released yet. Um, but, you know, and they, and they understand this far better than I do. So I'll leverage him. And it was speaking with Vincent Co. And he, he mentioned that he, he thought there were three areas that, you know, Generative AI particularly was going to have an immediate impact on the retail industry. And the first of which is one I wholeheartedly believe in you, knowing you, you and I could probably dig into all of these very, very easily together. But the first one he said is around AI powered product search and discovery. And I think that one is particularly intriguing because then you start thinking about the UX of digital commerce changes, right? You know, how I shop for things, how I look for things, how I search for things is changing. And, and what those digital interfaces are going to look like five years from now, even 10 years from now are going to be drastically different. So you've got companies like Amazon that are experimenting with, experimenting with this, Google that's experimenting with this, Walmart's in, in the lead on this too. It's going to be really fascinating to watch that play. The other two that he mentioned are uh, dynamic pricing optimization, uh, which isn't necessarily really generative AI. That's just hardcore AI too, uh, which I think also makes sense. You know, you're seeing retailers adopt electronic shelf labels in their store uh, for these reasons. Like it gives them more flexibility on pricing and enables them to be mark to market in store at any time with what they're selling online, which traditionally they haven't been because the pricing change process in a physical store has always been a paper process requiring labor to update your shelf tags. And that now goes away. And so it offers all this new, all these new capabilities in terms of how retailers can think about their pricing and what pricing they want to put in front of their consumer each and every day. And then the last one he brings up, which is kind of an offshoot of that as well, is um, personalized marketing and recommendations. You know. Um, which personalization is always what we hear about in the retail industry. If you follow it closely, I get tired of that word. Honestly, I think it's overused. I'm always like, you know, whenever I do an interview for Shop Talk, whenever I'm prepping a guest, I'm always like, what do you want to talk about? They're like, personalization. I'm like, okay, what about personalization? Right. You know, um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think what everyone's trying to say is there's a lot of opportunity to make the marketing we do more relevant and to scale the marketing to more people. And that's where generative AI is particularly interesting to me is. You're able to scale things to more people more quickly and to reach a wider audience than you ever were before. And therefore, if you do that in the right way, you should be serving up more relevant product to people at the right price. And again, going back to the first one, on an interface that is even easier to use and tailored to them individually in terms of how they want to search and browse when they're shopping online. Hmm. I want to run a thought experiment by you. Yeah. So imagine if every single retailer, let's just focus on the US, had electronic dynamic tags in their stores. Mm -hmm. what, what percentage of increase in revenue do you think they'll gain by that? Because there's either increase in revenue or you save cost. And um, that's just a very, because as I look at the physical nature of oh. where people buy, that's not pervasive yet. And I'm wondering, you know, that, that's a layer for sort of this exponential curve. What, what's your gut feeling on what that would do to the industry in terms of revenue? My, my gut feeling from, and from the companies I've talked to that are deploying the solution, what you're getting at is actually the big reason that it's valuable. It's actually not the labor savings of putting the tags out. It's actually the fact that you know you're right priced on shelf. Um, I was a former store manager at Target and Every single day I would walk the store. I was a district manager actually too. And so every single day I'd walk my stores. Um, I had 12 of them that I oversaw. And every single day I'd go into them. And every single day I'd find shelf, uh, promotional shelf tags lying on the floor. And mm. so my customers would not know that those products were on sale. And so by having electronic shelf labels in your stores, and also, if you use other technology, you can even make sure that this happens with an even greater degree of confidence, i.e. computer vision, like some retailers are using. You can make sure that your promos are promoted to the customers at the right time when they're in your store. And that drives a significant increase. And I'll tell you, I used to tell my store employees like, hey, see that tag on the floor, go and pick it up, go print a new one out of the back and put it on. And they'd be like, what, Chris, why are you making me do that? And I'd be like, 
Because I can tell you, having been a merchant at Target headquarters, that the sales on that product will go up at least six times. And that was a fact. I mean, as soon as you promote a product, it would go up at least six times. And that was probably, you know, a, 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 a low estimate for the most part. You know, like when sale, when products are on sale, they can go up pretty, pretty darn significantly. So there's a lot of revenue here. So that's why I think you've got companies like Walmart going after this. They've deployed it. They're saying they're going to deploy electronic shelf labels in half their chain. You have Schnucks going chain wide. You've got other retailers starting to do the exact same thing. Yeah, and I imagine if that's actually paired really well with computer vision, that's personalization to a degree. I walk by, a, I get a different price to, you know, you coming up behind me because I know I had that thing in cart. I know modulo any sort of data tracking. I know that's always a, mm-hmm. a big challenge in the industry for personalization. Well, I- yeah, and the key thing, Mark, too, is I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of dynamic pricing, like you know, okay. individualized dynamic pricing. I mm. think that that's that's a bridge too far for me for the American consumer. I think any company that tries mm. to do that, and we saw we saw the kerfuffle that started when I think it was Wendy's that I can't remember who it was. I think it was Wendy's that said they were going to do dynamic pricing on their menu boards for individual customers, and and they got a whole heck of a lot of grief for that. I don't like that, but I do like what you're saying about using computer vision to understand if your price is correct on the shelf too. Cause that's the other thing, like a tag can be wrong too, but you can use computer vision to understand that it's right. And then what, what it does enable you to do is I think to promote your products more often as well. So previously you had to print out large, you had to run large print jobs to run a new promotion. Now you can change those whenever you want. So you can have, you know, more promotions running each week. You can have intraday promotions, but at the end of the day, everyone in a physical store should probably be seeing the same price. Otherwise, you're going to get, you know, that, that's not going not gonna to fly with uh, people from a PR perspective, I don't think. No, that's a fair point. I didn't, that, it's good that you recalibrated me there uh, for a second. No, everyone always thinks that. So I was like, kind of like, okay, let's slow our roll on that. When we talk, especially when we talk about retail innovation, like th- that one's really far out there for it. And I think it's a very dangerous one for people to even start testing. Hmm. Um, so in what you said, the dynamic pricing optimization, I had initially thought my mind was just completely focused on online because I also work with a lot of retailers as well. Right. And I, I didn't necessarily think about its impact sort of in the store and something I've been, you know, the different people experience different hardships in the economy. And I mm-hmm. think when you walk through at least Walmart's around where I am, yeah, they, they are the closest grocery stores. And I think you get to see different populations of, of people. And you realize if this store didn't exist, a lot of people would be in trouble. And, and just that impact of why it's important to get these things right, especially with AI and investing in those. So mm-hmm. I like that you call out um, dynamic pricing optimization. What's your thoughts on product discovery in the store? How that's with all these planograms, how do I arrange a store? That's typically, I, I guess, done with a lot of experts. How do you see AI impacting that? I'm not as big on that, actually. That's, interesting. Mm-hmm. that's an interesting okay. question, too. No one's ever asked me that before. Um, I, I'm not as big on that. Um, and for a couple of reasons. The first one is, one of the things I think has hurt the retail industry overall is we've lost the art of the merchant, the, the art of the, the person that, like, has a creative vision for what the store should look like or what the products on shelves should look like and just understands that to a degree in terms of what's going to captivate their customer and designs their planograms to that end. And instead, what we've le- leaned more into as an industry, particularly in the commodity-driven categories, is kind of the MBA, I got out of college, let me look at what sells, let me look at the orientation of my planograms and and let me use my data to help determine how I should place things and how many SKUs I should have and how many you know, shelvings of what product I should have. That matters to a degree. And so I, I worry that if you start using generative AI to, to do that across the industry, all of our retail experiences are going to look the same at the end of the day, um, which if you look at how it does content right now, that is a factor. Like, you know, if you start using generative AI to write your descriptions for your podcast, pretty soon they all start sounding the same. Like the word revolution gets, revolutionizing this gets used all the time. It drives me nuts. But uh, I can tell who's using, you know, generative AI and their stuff. So 
Um, so that's a risk now, but I think it's category dependent a little bit. Like I think, you know, it'll probably be more applicable to like the dry grocery categories for sure. The hardcore CPG categories, they'll, they'll find ways to leverage it in terms of the category management uh, efforts that they put towards retail. But I think in the softer side of things like apparel, home, there's still an art to merchandising where if you start using generative AI to that end for that purpose, I think there's a lot of risk there, quite frankly. And I, it's mm-hmm. not something I would recommend a retailer look at, at at this point. I probably would look at it if that was a CPG on the category management side, but I wouldn't recommend it for the other categories. That's illuminating because I, I would put myself in a as an archaic data scientist, not yeah. maybe as aligning as much with a merchant. This is why this is fascinating. I read um, Made in America by, by Walton. And oh, yeah. That, was, that book really made me understood why Walmart operates the way that they do and how much of that culture still permeates. So can you share with us, AI folks, what is the importance of a merchant and uh, based on what you're saying, why, they'll, why they'll be everlasting essentially in retail? It's a really interesting question. So in the digital space... And I, I, I don't know what Amazon thinks about this question either, but my hunch would be that the, okay. the Amazon team doesn't actually think a merchant's that valuable because at the end of the day, it depends on your approach. Like in the digital space, so much can be done through software to get your products available to people and put them in their hands as easily as possible. And there's no, no end to the size of the assortment with which one can operate, right? However, in a physical store, again, we talked about this at the outset, physical constraints come into play. So someone has to decide how much of a larger subset of products that are in the digital sphere are going to enter my physical stores and in what locations across my chain. That is not something that is 100% easily answered at this point by, by just technical data, so to speak. Um, And for example, like the reason I can tell you that is like having been a merchant, you know, there were things that I did that worked that the data never would have told me about. Like I was a beach towel buyer and one of the beach towels I came up with, yeah, I know, right? One of the beach towels I came up with was a, a six and a half foot rolled towel. No one had ever done it. There was no data on if it would work. I mean, maybe, maybe there could have been, but the data was not easily findable, but it was in the marketing handle. And I built an entire four foot section of beach towels dedicated to marketing a six and a half foot rolled towel, which was a half foot longer than any other towel on the market and was a better price than what you're going to get at Walmart. And the thing crushed. It was my best selling towel. And so there was a combination of intuitive decision making there and then deciding how to merchandise it in store that I think is still important and that and for that reason I think the merchant still plays a key role in in deciding what goes into a store or doesn't and they're the gatekeepers really in the physical retail mm. experience they have been and they will always will be but the digital side is still getting stronger and stronger and so in that realm, I think the merchant isn't as important. And I think retailers need to understand that. I think sometimes they think merchants are holding them back digitally for that reason, because they want to keep a control on their assortment. And that's why marketplaces are taking longer to get set up by all these retailers than probably should. Uh, and then the other thing too, is you have the influencers in, that, in the digital sphere that kind of by f- default play the role of the merchant in a store because they're kind of the authority on products. And the merchants, again, have to see control to them to say, okay, you can pick what products you want to promote for me online. And that's a good thing. Like they should be doing that. But yet you merchants are still the gatekeeper of what goes inside your physical stores. I like this. Oh, this is getting me very creative juices flowing from an AI perspective. Um, so I spoke, I interviewed the chief scientist at Shopify, yeah. Mike Demir, right? And one of the things that he kind of reminded me or opened my mind to, I think what's different between the previous generation of AI and Gen AI is that we would operate in the feature space before, meaning I would describe a product as 
I don't know how much people like it. There are these arbitrary representations of a product and how it operates in the real world. And then I would, for instance, in personalization, mm-hmm. I would describe a human as all of the things that they looked at, right? And, and I would always construct an algorithm based on these numeric features. But now with language models, I can describe it in natural language. Yep. So that's the sort of fundamental difference. These models now work in our language space. So as a merchant, I'm thinking, imagine if there was a merchant GPT where you can really go feel what people are saying yep. at mass yep. and talk to them, right? Yep. And, and making you even more powerful as a merchant yep. inside of a business. Because um, mm-hmm. I imagine that's very difficult for you as a single person to represent the entire population coming into a store at that location. And oh yeah, it's impossible. Kind of- yeah. No, you're bringing, no, you're bringing up a great point. And actually, I 100% agree with what you're saying there. I think like, so if I go back to my example, the six and a half foot rolled and I, I put my kind of thought process to the test, I think you're 100% right. Like you could, you can use Genev AI to find those opportunities more easily. Like you can be mining the social, social sphere to see what, what are those untapped opportunities that you as a merchant want to take a bet on. And so, yeah, to, it could surface up like an idea like six and a half feet. Let's make a towel that's six and a half feet long. Um, but what, it, what, what the other part I was thinking about when I was talking before that it comes back to though, is you still also have to understand at the end of the day, what the product feels like. And again, this is particularly more important in apparel and home categories or, you know, a discretionary categories for the most part, you have to understand what the, the towel feels like. So, so like, if I just put in the parameters, like I want a towel at this cost, you know, a lot of people can give me a towel at this cost, but there's going to be quality trade-offs. Like. I want to make sure it weighs a certain amount. I want to make sure it absorbs a certain amount. I want to make sure the shearing is of a high quality. And I, as the merchant, should know, and my sourcing team should know where the best places are to go and get those things. And and then ultimately, the product that I put on the shelves has to feel and look a certain way, which is something that I think probably AI could do over time, but my hunch is it's not quite there yet. I'm curious what you think, though. Yeah, I think... You really raise something important there because in any retail business, one that has both an online and a physical presence, it's all about vocabulary alignment. Mm-hmm. That's the main game. Right. right. It's a great way to online put it. product yeah, discovery. It's just vocabulary alignment. Yep. I say a product feels like this, or I describe a product in these terms, and it's your job as a retailer to resonate with me as a customer and the 50 other definitions of this product in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. And I, I see sort of a streamlined way to hardening of taxonomies where taxonomies are a lot more fluid yep. and in touch with what people are saying and now that you bring in this notion of texture um yeah i do see why this problem is, is really hard because what does texture feel like for one person versus another um i do think it could kind of remove maybe some biases as well meaning yep. you as a merchant have just experienced three towels versus collecting all merchants feeling about the plethora of towels out there. Yep. Um, so it's this codifying intuition into a hardened vocabulary where we can meet our customers in their own language. Yep. That's one yep. thing that's speaking out to me. Well, and the other the point that's really interesting to me that you got me thinking about too is, again, because we're talking about the placement of products in physical stores where you're space constrained. But the converse of that is what Timu and Sheehan are doing, which is they're capitalizing on the counterfactual to what you're saying, which is like, we're never going to get it right, right? And our idea is that we're going to put something out in that common vocabulary in the digital sphere. We're going to make small production runs of it, see what people gravitate towards, see what people are happy with, and then we'll invest in it once we know that answer. But the idea is to place a lot of bets to see what people are telling them and then get into those products. Now, I think there are extensions of taking that model by building that into a physical retail operation, by taking that same model, building it upstream and using that to inform what ultimately goes into the store as well. But we're a long way from that. I'm surprised actually we haven't seen anybody really dip their toe into that yet. I wouldn't be surprised if Walmart's trying to think about how to do that, but I don't know that. That's just pure conjecture from on my part because I think there's a real opportunity there. But yes, I think... There's a lot of ways that you can approach this theoretically and philosophically based on what you want to be good at and what you don't. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting to observe 
how different retail businesses operate and their priorities, especially as they're focusing on all of their uh, sort of different AI operations. Um, here's a, a really interesting one. Okay. Given that- Even more? Okay, wow. are, All right, let's keep going. Yeah. So uh, this is not necessarily an AI thing, but, but given that prices are rising, yeah. uh, do you think that customer loyalty will hold across brands? in retailers where they shop? No, I don't. I mean, I think, you know, I go, I go back, I go back to um, one of the professors I had at business school, Clayton Christensen. He always said like all things being equal, customers will always gravitate towards the lowest price. And especially if there are, are budget constraints that they need to take into account too. So, and I think the data is proving that out. I mean, you look at my former employer target um, Target's been taking a hit in the higher income shop with the higher income shoppers and Walmart's been seeing the benefit of that and they've been stating so publicly. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's a real factor to consider a hundred percent. But it's also interesting too. So like I, I just, I was living under a rock <laughs> for a long time. Okay. And so I live in Florida. Uh -huh. And I didn't realize that pub subs are a thing. So the subs that you get from Publix. Publix yes, I've heard about those. I haven't had one yet, but I've heard about them. So I'm completely hooked on them. Yeah. I'm 100% I'm hooked on them because imagine you go into a deli and then I could go say, make me a sandwich with all that meat in the deli that I usually wouldn't buy because I think it's too expensive, but they'll put it in at the same price and super fancy cheese. And so it's just this little wedge that gets me into Publix every time. Mm -hmm. So I live next to Publix and sort of like Walmart. So I could even just watch my own dynamics. Target is a little further away. Mm -hmm. So I could, I'll only sneak into Target for certain things. So I can see my loyalty shifting. Yep. Publix has me on, on the sort of fresh food sub kind of thing as well. Um, so this is, it, it's interesting how different retailers will have a wedge to sort of bring you in the store. That has nothing to do with AI. That's just knowing the human as well. Um, and that's what I'm, at least coming back to a lot in this conversation with you is reminding ourselves that knowing the human is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, um, I think so. Yeah. There's no, there's no supplement for that, but I think, you know, the great thing about the technology is, is, is that it enables us to understand ourselves better as, better as humans too. And which is mm -hmm. both liberating and scary at the same time. Yeah. Good, good point. So you interact with a lot of different, folks in the space. How do you segment? I'm saying, I know retail is not the right term maybe, but how do you segment the, re the retail market? Oh, in your mind? wow. Uh, I mean, I think generally when you're talking, yeah, it's a good question. There's, there's a little bit of a limitation of words a lot of times when we talk about things, but you know, I think generally when you're talking about getting products to people, uh, for the most part, you know, the parties that are involved in that are the retailers and then the relationships they have with the brands or the manufacturers that put the products on the shelves. So those are the two main constituencies. And then you get some delivery service providers and things like that in there, like FedEx and UPS and things like that. But for the most part, you know, the core decision makers that, that I'm talking about day to day in retail are the retailers themselves and the brands. And then, you know, underneath that, you get the verticals in terms of who plays in what. So you've got the grocers, you've got the mass market super centers like the Walmarts, the Targets, you've got the dollar stores, Dollar General, Dollar Tree. Um, you've got the, the drug side of the business, the CVSs, the Walgreens, the sporting goods side like Dick's, um, the warehouse clubs like Sam's Club and Costco. You know, those are the, and those, I mean, and then of course you have the specialty apparel players too in the department stores. Like those, that's pretty, I think I covered 95% of the industry there in terms of the verticals, um, may have left one out. Oh yeah, I did beauty, you know, beauty would be the other big one too, like Ulta and Sephora. Um, but those are really the verticals that are, you know, at play. And, you know, for the, for the most part of our audience, we play, we play to the top 100 retailers. We talk, we play to the big guys. That's who we're, we're focused on because we think that's where where the big investments are happening from a technology standpoint. Of course, the young startups are going to be doing things differently. I've mentioned Sheen and, and Timu for the most part, and they're not even that young at this point, but you know, they're challenging things. They're challenging the incumbents. We try to keep track of that and then watch to see how those big, big retailers in the U.S. are moving or trying to adapt to what they're doing and where they're putting their dollars to do so. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see that Gen AI is more of a, a sub-vertical focus in terms of impact. And what I mean by that is 
will Gen AI impact sporting more than beauty or beauty more than sporting? What's your gut feel on which of those subcategories will can see the biggest impact? I've never thought about that. Um, I actually, I do think, I, I don't, th- off the top of my head, I don't think it will impact the retailer end of the vertical that much um, or the CPGs that play in those verticals. But I do, my gut tells me from talking to people initially that the CPG side of retail will feel a disproportionately beneficial impact of the adoption of AI over the retailers. And the reason I hmm. say that is because they have, they have more control over their pricing that they're giving to the retailers at you know, wholesale. They have more control over, they are the ones that spend the marketing dollars for the most part, the big CPG brands in particular, right? So they're the ones that are going to benefit from, 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 from what we talked about in terms of scale of marketing and more relevancy of their marketing. So I think, you know, when you take those two factors, I think they're disproportionately going to feel the benefit. And from the initial conversations I've had, like I interviewed um, a gentleman from Pernod Ricard over at Shop Talk Europe this year, and he was listing out case after case after case of actual AI implementations that are driving improved productivity and improved profitability for his business. And I was sitting there going, oh my God, I could talk to you for hours. And my only question was, well, everyone in the CPG side of the business can do that. So, you know, I think that's, that, that's one thing I would say is I think the CPG side, and also they they seem more innovative to, to try to, to follow the lead on these types of things that I think retail does in general too. So I think that plays into it as well for me, but I think pound for pound, I think they'll see a more immediate benefit than the actual retail community. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, So I guess one thing there. There's a hardcore retailer, so I've I've been fortunate to meet folks who are maybe not in the top 100. And, oh yeah, uh, there's so many retailers. Ex- yeah, right. Yeah, and these executives will align to me. You know, I'm telling them about AI, and they're just like, "Listen, I'm a retailer. I sell physical goods, <laughs> right? I'm not this big Walmart. Oh boy, and, and I'll always be a retailer. And so so firm to it. And at least what I took away from that is what percentage of the the retail population, and I'm defining the retail population as the top 100 who are technology first, and then the tail end of the spectrum where they're super hardcore. What time frame do you think it'll take for them to move over? Not completely. I don't think they'll ever be 100, not necessarily Gen AI, whatever it is tomorrow, but uh, what time period do you think it'll, it'll start shifting that hardcore, I'm not technology? What's your thoughts there? I think, you know, I think it goes back to what we said before. I, my bet would be it'd probably take 15 to 20 years for the shift to happen. 15 to 20 years. Yeah, okay, okay. I you know, I, I think it's a little bit of gener- it's a little bit of a generational thing ultimately. I think that's why we see these mm. these innovation curves the way that we do. The great example that I used, it was given to be a bu- by a buddy of mine. He's a VC, his name's Carl Bracken. He uh he pointed me to this this uh example. Um, and I used to use it a lot for digital commerce and I haven't thought about it, but I probably should start using it for, for AI too. But he used, he told me this example, there's a great video on YouTube. You, I'm guessing you might've seen it, Mark, but it's called the reverse engineered bicycle. You, you no, should take a look I at it. It's that. really great. So this, okay. this engineer guy was probably 15 years ago now, but he did this, he did this great experiment. He, he reverse engineered a bicycle so that if you wanted to turn the bike to the left, you actually had to turn the wheel to the right. All right. Yeah. So it's a complete, you know, okay. a complete mind, mind trick. Right. And so, but he didn't just do that. He did something then that was really interesting. He, he taught himself to ride the bike. And I think it took him something like six to eight months of daily practice to learn how to rewire his brain to ride the bike. And which makes sense, right? You, you and I having ridden a bike, we'd be like, oh my God, how long would it take me to do that? But then he did something even more interesting. He gave the bike to his like eight year old son who had never ridden a bike. And it took his son two weeks to learn how to ride that bike mm. because he never knew any differently. And that whole concept is neuro, the idea of neuroplasticity, which is the older we are or the more accustomed we are to doing things a certain way, the harder it is for us to do something new. And so that's what, you, that's what, I, what I think about when I hear like, oh, I'm a physical retailer. I don't need that stuff or I don't need to think about this right now. That's because their minds have been come, they become neuroplastically rigid 
over the years from learning how to do things a certain way. And so then I think it takes generational change who have come up learning things differently, have a different perspective on things to make that change happen. So that's why I think, you know, I'd probably bet on 15 to 20 years before we start seeing this, you know, as, as the uh, just normal operating procedure. Mm -hmm. Do you think from a timeline perspective, so you, you raise a very interesting point about um, <laughs> population revenue. And what I mean by that is the folks who are spending the most of these top 100 retailers are from some particular population. Mm -hmm. And there's a, they're aging out to a degree. And then there are new folks that are coming in that are demanding probably more diversity or even uh, smaller selection. What do you think is like the year, uh, the, the tipping point year where those folks who are coming in have enough capital to, to really start demanding and it's an arbitrary question, but I just wanted to get your, your gut sense. Yeah, right. that's a, it's, a good, it's a good question too. And it's funny, like I actually don't, I don't think about it that way in terms of the population okay. that the retailer is serving. I think about it more as the population of executives that are making the decisions. Because Ooh. one of the other things that's really interesting, and Doug McMillan's famous for talking about this, the CEO of Walmart, he keeps in his pocket the top 10 retailers in the US by decade. And if you look at that list, it's actually really fascinating because it changes pretty greatly. And so what the reason, the reason I point that out is when I hear your question is, it doesn't matter if you're old or young, really. And you can, you can, you can, the testament to that is how many old people shop on Amazon right now. You know, like, you know, there's just a lot of older people shopping on Amazon. So it's really about how do consumers want to consume product? What is the best, most efficient way for them to do that? And which retailers get on board with the change in the tide in mass to do that. So, so I think the bigger question is more, who are the retailers that are going to figure that out and bend to this, this new design of, or this new desire of how we want to shop as the younger consumer continues to evolve and that pushes upstream into the older consumer as well. That's the $64,000 question that's, that's on the table because I think everyone to some degree will want to start shopping this way. I mean, gosh, as soon as Apple puts AI on our phones, a large proportion of the population is going to get exposed to this in a different way. And so they're going to get acclimated to it. And the consumer acclimation will happen faster than the retailer acclimation at the end. Of it. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Hmm. So we should be watching for that shift in consumer patterns first, and then essentially following that that breadcrumb trail. Yeah, and that's why I mean that's that that's why the U, the the UX theory of this like how does the UX change in digital commerce as customers get more acclimated to shopping in a new way and whatever the hell that looks like. I have no idea what that's going to look like, but it's going to look like something. That's why that's such a fascinating question, especially when you go back to like carrying around the top 10 retailers by decade in your wallet. Like Who's going to be the first to figure out that UX and what impact will that have on that list? Fascinating question. Hmm. UX over AI. That's what I'm hearing. Well, or the, the, really the combination of the, inter the Venn diagram of both, right? Yes. Um, so you mentioned marketing. Let's, yeah. let's talk marketing. And I, I think that's a fascinating topic. I think one of the main barriers to entry, I think right now for but Gen AI with brands that I've seen is just character consistency. How do I maintain the fidelity of both the text that I generate, making sure it's on brand, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, in addition to the actual imagery honing to the brand values and guidelines. I think that's still sort of open area of research. But let's say it was perfect. It could, it could perfectly generate an image for any CPG product, for any retail product super personalized, what do you think the consumer wants from their advertising? Wow. Uh, I mean, I don't think I have anything, you know, any big epiphanies on that one, honestly. I mean, I think the consumer wants relevant advertising that's right price to them in the moment that price. captures their purse strings or their heart strings as well. So that, that, that would be what I would say. Hmm. And I don't know if you're sort of following the whole debate about human written articles mm -hmm. versus AI oh, yeah. generated articles, right? Yep. Um, do you do you see something like that happening where humans will pattern match and know, okay, this is a completely AI generated ad 
And we're moving into the gender future. I, I think we'll get to that point um, soon enough. Um, but what's your thoughts there on, on that resistance to, okay, this is AI generated and versus that human connection? Yeah, I think it actually, it's funny. I think there's a lot of parallels to the discussion we were having with, um, you know, the role of the merchant, honestly, that there's the creative person that can put their stamp on something in a way that no one has seen before. Um, and not to say that AI can't do that, but there are people that can do that as well. So I think, it, I think to answer your question, I think it will depend on what you're trying to consume. So if I'm trying to just get an update on the news, I don't really care who writes it. But if I want an opinion on something that is thought out and takes into various points of view, that's something I'm probably going to look to someone else to provide me. You know, I think of like, for me, like, who do I look at in that space? Like a Scott Galloway is somebody, I think some people look at me and my writing, uh, you know, in that vein as well. Um, now I think, can, can any of us use AI to help us in the furtherance of our goals, which is putting out unique content to people? Yes, because it's, it's a powerful steroid. It's, it's an augmentation of our ability to put our thoughts together in a new way which actually makes our voices that much more powerful if we think about it and harness it in the right way. Um, but, you know, with that said, I think, you know, it could be, it could, that the tool could be used to, uh, you know, write my thoughts completely for me. Uh, but over time, I think that's difficult because I think at least right now, a lot of what you write will start to sound the same over and over again over time. And so I think, you know, going into those undiscovered territories is where the where the rubber will meet the road, and you know where you know Stephen King is. Why Stephen King is Stephen King? Because he can go in places the imagination can't go, or or where the data can't tell us to go. So there's a there's a notion of um, one sample efficiency. So sample efficiency mm. means that an AI model does not need to be shown a lot of data in order to adapt itself to whatever particular problem it's trying to solve. And I think another interesting problem, this is more workforce, but let's just focus on retail. Yeah. And I'll, I'll hone in on your merchandiser example, is that the, the population that retires. So imagine I, I, I'm a merchant at some big retailer mm -hmm. and I've been driving billions of dollars of revenue because in, in my territories, I, you've, you've figured it out. Yeah. But you're going to retire. And to some degree, every human wants this forever reoccurring stream of revenue, right? Everyone was chasing passive income, essentially. And I think now with AI, as these models become more multimodal, and, and it's a very interesting that you bring in the touch and tactile mm -hmm. thing, that's, that what also got me thinking in my mind when uh, an AI or we can describe touch and tactile as a human would feel it, um, I think there's an interesting opportunity to reduce the brain drain problem where Chris Walton generated X number of billions for Target in his tenure. I can have some representation of his intelligence forever baked in. And you get a piece every time I use this intelligence to increase my business. How do you think retailers would feel about that? And, and the last thing I'll say there is that I think you really get to see this uh, maybe in the hardware stores where. These folks have been there for a long time and they feel the yeah. products when you talk to them. You know, they, they build you up as a consumer. Yeah. Um, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, well, and hardware, another vertical that I forgot to mention. So th good one, uh, good, good drop there. Oh man, I mean, that, that's a really heady topic. I think what it comes down to for me though is again, inside a physical store, there are so many elements that are, that what we're talking about can't control. So like I could carry on the knowledge of that sales associate. And again, it depends on the vertical, but I think the hardware one's a good one for this. You go in, you need help, you know, you got a broken pipe or whatever. You need someone that knows what the heck they're doing. That person that's helping you also needs to be able to communicate that back. So if there's a world where you need someone to walk you through things where the physical contact with an individual is important and how that person is communicating back to you, it's going to be hard to replicate that fully, you know, 
in that experience. Otherwise, it just stays a digital experience. So I think what what if I'm placing my bets, what that means though is the the amount of digital commerce as a proportion of total commerce in our society will continue to increase. It will probably continue to increase at pretty strong levels. But there is going to be a point, and it's the same with customer service. When we call a customer service line for help, more and more of those interactions will be digital or digital only or digital led. But at times, we're still going to need to be triaged or turned over to humans that just know how to do things, which can be informed by AI, but the best of the best sales associates, the best of the best merchants, the best of the best customer service representatives will be the ones that know how to interpret all the data and communicate it back to me in a way that makes sense to me as a consumer. Mm -hmm. Yes, that makes sense. So on the business of retail, yeah, uh, I, I think most retailers now, especially the big ones, have to become technology companies. If they're not technology companies, they essentially, I don't think, will last uh, probably as long. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that mm -hmm. is... Um, they're, they're all collecting different pieces of data mm -hmm. to understand as their product line grows, their, uh, excuse me, their business grows to, to get a good summarized view of what's happening on granular levels. What are some of the challenges that you see these folks facing on the data side as, as things sort of grow and grow and grow? It'll only get bigger over time, essentially. It's a big, it's a big challenge in the retail industry. I think... Um you know, it raises a couple, a, a few different points. I think number one is it's, it's, you know, a lot of these retailers are spread. I, 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 and I, my focus is really U.S. retail, but I imagine this is, you know, the same problem everywhere for the most part. But, you know, US, if we just take the U.S. as an example, like U.S. retailers are spread all across the country. And, you know, and tech, tech is not, um, you know, for the most part. And, and, and tech for the most part, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, if you follow the news, tech wants to live where tech wants to live you know, or, or, or tech doesn't want to live anywhere. Even they, you know, a lot of times want to live remote and be nomads too. Um, so it is really hard for say a retailer in Nebraska, which there are a few to get the, t and even Minnesota where I live to get the tech talent to move or even want to work for a company based, you know, where they are. That's one issue. Then the second issue is the retailer's for the most part, don't have the muscle memory or the digital acumen like we've been discussing to know how to manage those people and know how to deploy them most efficiently. Um, so that's, that's a big risk. Now, with that said, everyone is probably investing in doing so more so than they have historically. But at the end of the day, I think what that plays out if I'm a betting person is that the amount of retail dollars that are generated from certain retailers will continue to go up as a proportion as well. So the big guys will continue to get bigger. The small guys, though, will continue to be less and less over, of them over time, which is, which is a pattern no different than we've seen throughout the history of retail based on other factors. But now technology and technology adaptation will be driving uh, how the industry congeals over the next 10 or 15 years to an even greater degree than it ever has before. Mm -hmm. So you just highlighted the, the expertise problem in order to solve the, uh, the data transformation desire mm -hmm. that any retailer has. What about sort of the computational costs to, to do so? What are you hearing folks saying about uh, to operate this business outside of the actual personnel itself, the compute, um, all of the things, where do I go host these things in the cloud? Do I bring it on prem? What are you hearing? I, on your I side? think that, I think that's part of like we said out the outset. I think that's actually partly why some retailers are skeptical and potentially rightly skeptical too, because a lot of the use cases that we've talked about with, with generative AI in particular are more revenue or productivity gains. Um, and so, you know, especially like the scaling of the marketing, like, okay, yeah, maybe I can scale my marketing better, but you know, that's kind of a big, there's a big question mark there. So how much do I want to invest in that? And am I sure am I going to see, am I sure that I'm going to see the ROI? And do I want all the other costs that are going to come with this? So, so I think it's a really big question on the minds of the retailers. And I, I think for the most part, you know, they are smart to kind of hold back and make sure that they're seeing what they want to see. The one thing I will say about the retail industry, I think they've gotten better about partnering with third parties to try to understand the answers to these questions than just trying to do it on their own as well, which is important when you think about the fact that you're, you're understaffed or under, 
um, under knowledge to in terms of what we're talking about. Is that mindset about doing it yourself? Was did that come from sort of a fear of competition? Because I I felt that a lot in uh, Sam Walton's book that you know he was very meticulous about having it done his way yeah. and no other way. Uh, what's your thoughts there? I think it is. Yeah, I think it is because when you know if you're a successful retailer, you've created a successful brand that is built on presenting things to your consumer in a certain way, the same way every day over time. Technology is different though. Like technology is is more about how you do things versus what you do. And so that's where I think there are more nuances to the argument. But when your culture is ingrained to think about, hey, we're going to do it our way or the, you know, the Sam Walton way or the Target way or the Costco way, um, it can trap you in culturally to not being open to thinking about, you know, what is the right rubric for me to decide? Do I want to build this myself? Is there a partner I can use to do this? Or even better, you know, do I even want to do it? You know, that's the other, that's the other big question. Mm -hmm. And and you spoke about, well, any new retail revolution takes an executive bet. And I, I like this framing of the future of retailers. What are the future of the executives going to, like, what are they going to do? I, I like that, that lens of looking at it. When someone goes to embark on a new big bet project, uh, what's sort of that initial funding that you've seen and time frame to get some initial feedback? Is it half a million, couple million, six months, I want to hear, you know, is this thing feasible? What have you seen um, in your purview? Uh, I've seen every, every, every walk of life, really. I mean, for the most part, I mean, you can, you can, yeah, really. I mean, if I think back, like you can, you could test something in six weeks and you can get some really good results and you can be very confident it's going to work. You can test something over a longer horizon and think it's going to work and find out it doesn't. So it really runs a range, Mark, in terms of, of, of how you I can see. look at this. Mm -hmm. And what, I guess you've been an executive. What is the pressure that an executive feels when they go to make a new bet? That's the most pressure you feel, honestly, as an executive. When you go to ask for money, um, and if, if you're fortunate enough to be an executive like I was to ask for money, that's a high pressure situation. Um, you know, and you're putting your, your reputation on the line that, it, that it's going to work. And, and, and you should be because you're getting paid the big dollars to, to make the decisions and to you know, talk the board and the executive team into why you need this money. So um, you know, it, you know, the risk comes with the job in a lot of ways. And I guess the time frame that you have to return results is fairly short uh, on the other months. Not many folks will probably be wait, willing to wait years. No, I right. Imagine. Yeah. I mean, most, most projects are, you know, have to show your ROI in a year to, you know, to 18 months for the most part. Any big investments. Okay. Uh, search. What, 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 how are you feeling about search? I know you mentioned uh, the gentleman from Amazon talked about product discovery. Yeah. Um, you are a former merchant. What's your sort of gut feel on where search is going and product discovery? Oh, I think it's, I think, I think it's so cool to think about. Um, I'm actually an advisor for a company called Own It AI, which is in this space as well, where they're basically trying to enable for retailers what Google AI overviews and what Amazon's new Rufus does uh, on their website, you know? And, um, mm -hmm. I think it's so fascinating. Like, you know, I've talked about it a little bit already, but you know, if I go on a website now, you know, for the most part, search is pretty static. Like you said, it's like a, it's just like a vocabulary word listing, like, you know, find this or, you know, and then, then, you know, it'll autofill for me, whatever it is. But, you know, if the search becomes like, you know, Hey, how I'm looking for a dress that is red for this party. And here's the, you know, here's kind of the accoutrements I want with the dress, like, and then they'll serve me up results and I can narrow it down. And like, you know, it just, it's a completely different way to go through the, the consumer purchase funnel by way of search. And I, like I said before, I, I don't think anyone knows exactly what that's going to look like. Um, but the other thing about it too, is the search in and of itself is going to get better because of all of this too, because you can get better product data, better product descriptions, better product imagery, more more videos attached to your products that are more interesting for people to mm -hmm. look at and enticing to buy. So 
So all of it's just going to fuel itself. And that's, that's where, that's like a great network effect and why I'm big on the, on the, 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 the innovations coming in, in search and browse and the new UX for, for changing how we do things. You got me super excited about that. I just thought of, imagine I look at a product and this any retailer really understands, you know, kind of what you're looking yeah. for and who you are at some level. And now it'll generate a product description video based on how I like to understand and filter products. And that's done, you know, with video generation, I think that'll actually be possible. Uh, pretty soon yeah uh, yeah no, there's some crazy things coming in video too um yeah and i like what you said before about there there it's a world where there is no taxonomy you know and the the taxonomy in a lot of ways is a holdover from the physical retail world too because you needed sections of the store to to demarcate where consumers need to travel when they're inside your store but if you get to a world where every time I go on a digital interface, it's personalized to me, the need for a taxonomy goes away and is really tailored to you as an individual. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've been enjoying this um, so far. Oh, retail media networks. Let's talk about Oh, retail God. Okay. Yes, we can't not I, talk I about think... retail media networks. All right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what? Okay, so let's let's go one on one. What's a retail media network, and what's your gut Man. feel on where these things are going? Given at all, I think that that has Gen AI is a big <laughs> impact and story to play there. But wanted to hear your opinion. Wow, really, that's a big question too. Um, and I'm I'm not a retail media expert. It's actually one of the areas where I've sure. not had a ton of experience, but I know enough to be dangerous. So what I say is, you know, retail media basically is a play on the fact that you know the 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 cookie world is changing, and there's only so many places where brands and advertisers can get first party data. And one of those places is from a retailer itself, the place that ultimately sells the product. So that's why all of, all of retail is moving into retail media. Now, depending on, you know, then you say, okay, yes, but w- what does that mean? So, you know, retail media can take the forms of many different things. It can take the forms of, you know, you know, search advertising, like on Amazon, it can take the form of you know, running an ad on a media network like Amazon Prime Video, you know, depend on the extent to which you've stood up your retail media network. It can take the form of running an ad on an electronic shelf label in a store, like probably like Walmart or Schnucks is thinking about doing in the near future. But, you know, so so you can have a number of different um, chambers in which to put bullets in the gun if you're going after retail media. And it's a big engine of growth, a big engine of profitability for these retailers because the advertising dollars are out there and the, and the brands need a place to deploy it. And so, so the question for me becomes, again, okay, if you think the future, who's going to win? Well, the, it's, you're going to see more uh, coalescing towards the big players again, the big players with the biggest media networks, the Amazons, the Walmarts, the targets of the world, because they're the ones that have the eyeballs both online and in store, which is where the media dollars are ultimately going to flow. So retail media, as sexy as it is, is not something that every retailer can do as effectively as another retailer. There are differences in what you can bring to the table. Mm-hmm. It's good. It's good overview. So one thing, one question that came up to me in, in sort of research for this is, um, it's ads. So it's all about yeah. essentially these ad platforms having services to serve ads, to find new customers, upsell product discovery. Why haven't more retailers gone into YouTube? It's a very sort of orthogonal market, but as you think of, and the reason why I'm saying this is that uh, YouTube channels are a great sort of advertising platform, especially when you have a very entrenched brand. What's your Hmm. gut feeling there? I don't know. What do you mean when you say you haven't gone into YouTube? Like you just think they're just not prioritizing it in their in their in their yeah, marketing strategy? Yeah, because it's a it's sort of like a yeah, it's an everlasting thing. So if you look at Mr. Beast, so mm-hmm. Mr. Beast is a good example. So he's now created, I think he's created both a media and a product empire now that he's launching products, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And I've always had this idea of um, ads are extremely intrusive. Mm-hmm. But what I'm I'm truly interested in, in the industry is where I'm actually not watching ads in between shows. Mm-hmm. I'm literally watching a show that is a big ad. Yeah. Where every piece of that show is specifically constructed. I have no, right. I see a Coke, I, I see this product, but I, I don't get interrupted. Yeah. And it's all gelled 
Um, and, and I think YouTube is a, is an interesting avenue to build brand recognition and just another ad surface mm-hmm. as well. So I was just curious as to why people haven't done it. Yeah. That. I think that the short answer is, I think it's really hard to do. Um, Fair you enough. know, I think it, it is really hard to create original content that is engaging. It's, I mean, it's really hard to replicate Mr. Beast. Let's just, I mean, that's I think fundamentally what you're talking about. And so I think the approach you've seen right now, whether it's YouTube or social media in general is either, you know, putting ads out in those platforms to then bring people back to the websites of the retailers themselves or the brands themselves, or partnering with uh, influencers by way of affiliate commissions to get them back to the website as well. The experiments we've seen with creating their own unique individual content have been small. Walmart's led the way on that. They created their own scripted television series on YouTube, actually. Uh, hmm. Last, I think it was last Christmas. It was called Add to Heart. You know, you get the play on Add to Cart. Um, and yeah. I don't think it did very well. I mean, it didn't get a lot of traffic. It wasn't well scripted. It wasn't interesting. It's it's really hard to do, and it takes a lot of you know money to do it well. Uh, you know, in addition, so I think the play that the retailers are are going for more is, you know, how do you stand up, you know, a real media presence throughout the all the vehicles that are out there, whether it's you know like Amazon with Amazon Prime or Walmart with its NBC Universal deal to plug their ads into those networks or Vizio, buying the Vizio TV screens to get your ads in front of more people that way uh, because you have the control of the first party data. I think that's more of what retailers are interested in because quite honestly, they just don't have the muscle memory to build out content in that way. Not to saying that it couldn't happen, but I think it, I think it is hard. Yeah, that makes sense. I know we're getting closer to time. So, so let's start wrapping up. But one, one big trend that's happening right now is I mentioned it before in terms of capturing the brain drain, but it's this digital representation of an influencer or a digital, completely artificial um, influencer, maybe brands, these retailers have their own or, you know, they subcontract, um, you know, name X influencer and their digital avatar. What are you seeing? How are you seeing that sort of shift in the game for consumer advocacy? I actually think that's a I think that's a fascinating topic of discussion. I think it, it actually just lends itself to what we've been talking about, which is just more interesting content in the world and more opportunities for commerce. Like there's the the beautiful thing about a TikTok algorithm or an Instagram Instagram algorithm is it is it finds what we're interested in, right? And so at the end of the day, there is no bad content because bad content's just never seen, right? At the end of the day. So like what what's really <laughs> That's what I always say. Like, you know, if nobody sees your bad content, you know, you you might, you might see like rude content, but like, if you just put out something that sucks, no one's going to watch it. So like, who cares? Um, Hmm. But so the, when you start talking about fully like AI generated content, I think it's really interesting because it gives more people that want to be influencers opportunities. So like, what are like, you know, I'll just put it out there. Like what, who are the influencers generally? They're people that are really funny. They're people that are generally probably better looking than the average person. But if I say, say I'm an, like, you know, say I'm just a funny, goofy looking dude or woman and, or whatever, and I want to create an avatar and I can put out really funny, interesting content with a digital representation of myself and people want to watch it. Hell yeah. I mean, that's just going to mean more people get more opportunities to make money off being an influencer. So I think you're, I think you'll see it take off 100%. Hmm. I, so I started a new podcast called Progress Guaranteed and I have a hypothesis that the space of careers is changing rapidly and there's not many, there's not really a map. It's not really defined. Yeah. And TikTok really opened my mind yeah. to this where I could see some person cooking food in a Chinese restaurant, earning money. The crazy ones are for me where I see a woman drawing people's names of calligraphy and she's getting paid. Right. And it, it's just blowing my mind in terms of what the true reality of commerce is on a, on a very small granular level. And I'm, I'm just trying to reframe my mind to not only think about scale as we think about, let's say, adoption of Gen AI, but trying to come back to those first principles. How does this work on the individual level or a small influencer level? I find those things to be uh, sort of quite fascinating. Yeah, I do too. Um, okay. Well, I was going to ask, are malls dead? Are malls dead? Uh, 
No, and I actually I, I got this one wrong. I thought I thought malls would have a tougher time than they did. I think the pandemic probably hmm. helped them a little bit because we've all been thirsting for getting back out in the in the real world. I think, you know, the B and C malls for the most part, you know, have been, you know, struggling, but the best of the best malls, they still have a place in our lives. And and the mall operators have done a great job reconfiguring or re-optimizing the portfolio of the experiences within them to cater to what the consumers want when they venture outside the house. So I don't, I don't think malls are dead by any stretch of the imagination. Um, uh, no. It's good. It's good to know. Uh, AI agents. What do you hang about AI agents in retail? What do you mean when you say agents? Ooh. Okay. So that's, you just answered my question. Okay. So what I mean, so there's all these LLMs. So yes, large language yes. models that can sort of understand mm-hmm. what you're asking. So the distinction between an agent and an LLM is that an agent can essentially format its output to call code mm. or to use a tool. Because right now this thing just responds to you and you do whatever. Yeah. So now it can understand what tools, you know, send a return order, send a thank you note type thing. So you can go execute those actions independently and then operate oh, got it. as any other person in a, in a business. Um, so I'm very excited to see where that's going to go in, in retail. I think that's going to be the big thing. Um, yeah. That's why I love doing these podcasts because I hear new terminology. I've heard of that concept, but the new terminology is great. And so, uh, yeah, I'll have to start digging into that to see what I think. Yeah, I think the main barrier to entry that I've seen in discussion so far is just going to be the security aspect. Because yeah. when you have these independent things calling a bunch of code, and I think people have some concerns there. Yeah, it seems like um, the security so, aspect's a big, we haven't really talked about it, but it, it is actually a, a, a much bigger factor than we've probably let on in this conversation too. Yep. Um, so what did I get? A little bit of career advice, right? Okay. You've been a VP, you, you talk to all these folks um, sort of at the big level. What's been your career optimization function? And what I mean by that, so in machine learning, all these things are doing right. is, what are the best parameters to minimize my error? So in, in your case, what does Chris do and what is Chris optimizing for? Is it time? Is it wealth? Is it happiness? How have you chosen to architect uh, your career? Yeah, um, I think for me, it's, it's kind of been an intersection of a number of things. You know? So you know, people always tell you, um, you know, go where your passion is. Um, I think that's true to a degree, but there has to be a few other conditions that overlap in the Venn diagram of concentric circles, like, right? And so, you know, so when I was at, when, you know, I was early in my career, you know, the passion was, you know, making products that I could put in front of the consumer, right? And so, you know, the other element of that is, can you make money? money doing that right and so yes you could and then the other thing is the other third part of the circle is are you good at it um and Mm. so those have been really the three things that i ask myself and so when i left target in 2017 and went out and created omni talk and basically started our own media company um i didn't know it at first but i had a hunch that there was a passion there for writing or editorializing on the future of retail um, and potentially even longer term editorializing on other topics too. Um, and, but the question for me was, was I good at it? And so I started running experiments to understand and, and could I make money on it too, Mark? Honestly, um, we were talking before we started, but, uh, and you know, I started running experiments and over time I learned that the answer was yes to all three of those things. And so that's why I've stuck with it. And that's why we're now in year eight of of entrepreneurship and, and, and making it work. Fantastic. And the other thing is, so I'm in data science and retail and I look to your podcast and, and um, your show as one of the top voices because it, it really made it ring clear when the CEO of Walmart showed up to you at NRF. I was like, okay, like this dude is <laughs> one. He's, they've, they've, they've done it because when you get someone at that level to show up, to share their voice with you, I think that's tremendous credence to what you guys have built over that time and the amount of trust that you guys have garnered um, in the marketplace. So congrats on that. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. What are three books you recommend people read? Could be anything. Uh, oh my God. Uh, geez. Uh, okay. So <laughs> funny, funny story. I'm always a terrible answer for this question because about 10 years ago, I started reading Entertainment Weekly put out the 100 greatest novels of all time. And I've read 93 of them so far. 
And so let's see. So the ones that are coming to mind for me, um, I just finished the Harry Potter series. I'd recommend that to anyone. Okay. okay? Um, there's a series called uh, uh, Run Rabbit by uh, the Rabbit Quartet by John Updike, which is also fascinating. Uh, and then, of course, I think the last one I'd recommend is To Kill a Mockingbird because that's just such an amazing book. That's a good book. What's one piece of advice you have for a high schooler, someone in college, and a professional? And I like to highlight high school just because we don't know who's listening at the end. All right. Um, man, okay. So these are, these are on the spot questions. Okay, so let me think about this. This whole interview has been, it's, that's why I've enjoyed it so much. Um, so for a high schooler, I think put in the work. I think put in the work for sure. Uh, for a college student, I would say don't narrow in on what you plan to study. I made the mistake of double majoring in economics and history, and I regret it to this day because I had to take all my classes in economics and history, and I didn't get exposed to as many subjects as I could have. There's art history classes I would have taken, architecture classes I would have taken, computer science classes I would have taken. So that'd be my number one thing. And then the second piece was a graduate student. Um, the graduate student, I'd be very definitive on that rubric that we just talked about in terms of the three things, like keep that solely in focus. Otherwise, you might go down a road that you find out you don't enjoy and aren't that happy with, or you might go down another road where you're like, oh, shoot, uh, you know, intellectually, you're not that happy with, or you might go down a road of being like, oh, shoot, there's not a lot of money to be made here. And I'm not going to like what this looks like 20 to 30 years down the road. So there's one aspect. Uh, what advice do you have for professionals and especially executives, given what you've seen? For me, the, the biggest thing that separates the average executive for me, particularly in the industry I cover, is just is, is one word. It's curiosity. I think that's what the best of the best executives have that separates them and keeps them successful in the long run in terms of being able to adapt themselves to whatever challenges they face. I think for the most part, when you start talking about the typical characteristics of an executive, like ability to communicate, ability to lead a team, to think strategically, those things all kind of gravitate towards a mean. But at the end of the day, you've got to stay curious about how you're doing your job. Okay, so here's my, my rapid round. First question, you're stuck on an island uh, for the next 10 years, but you have a specialized chef that can cook anything possible. You could take an order food from anywhere, whatever you want, but you only get two meals to eat for the next 10 years. What two meals would you eat? Anything is possible. Pizza and buffalo wings. That was just, that was quick. You had those loaded, ready to go. I like that. Um, what's one thing that brings you joy? Fantastic. And so this last one is not necessarily um, anything about being famous. It's more of a, I, I like to understand from people, how do they think? very long term about their life because at the end of the day one day uh, omni retail talk will end as a show you know what i mean and you'll move on um what do you want people to remember about you and it's not about being famous it's just about what was your sort of ethos but in time that you're going to be here mm, that's an interesting question um yeah no, that's interesting particularly because I, I had a stroke in 2021 so that was almost a very important topic for me to think about. And I think about it every day now, um, honestly. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't have any grand idea here. I think it's just, you know, that I lived my life, tried to treat everyone with respect that I could and uh, was very strong in my convictions of what I believed in, what I didn't. And, you know, and, and I hope people respect me for that. It's beautiful. Well, Chris, I want to say um, I've been filled in this interview. So I, I, Truly want to say thank you for coming on the show and, you know, taking a bet on me in, in me starting this show and just wanted to say an honest thank you. Awesome, man. Yeah, no, I, I love this. I thought it was such a great format and such a great discussion and uh, really just super engaging for me overall. So thanks for having me on. Fantastic. We'll be in touch. Great, man. Talk to you later. <laughs>